we think about diseases like cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease, as diseases of aging, but I would argue they're diseases of skeletal muscle. New York Times bestselling author. She has an incredible message. She is a physician. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. The more healthy skeletal muscle mass you have, the greater your survivability against nearly all causes of death. You can always become more capable mm -hmm. and skeletal muscle is this organ of longevity. I think we should think about exercise mm -hmm. as a non-negotiable. 50% of Americans are not exercising. We need to overcome what happens with aging to maintain the health of skeletal muscle. Burning fat, heart disease, reversing diabetes, staying sharp, building muscle, and boosting energy. So if you're not interested in any of those things, <laughs> please stop watching. You know, as humans, we all want growth. The real key to longevity is Hey guys, welcome back to the Ultimate Human Podcast. I'm your host, human biologist, Gary Brecka. We go down the road of everything anti-aging, longevity, biohacking, and everything in between. And today is a really, really special day for me. I have a guest on. I've actually been chasing for the last few months, trying to coordinate calendars and schedules. I'm an enormous fan of this osteopathic physician. She is a New York Times bestselling author. Uh, she coined the term muscle sense centric uh, aging, and she has the Muscle Centric Institute. Um, she is also dominating the airwaves and the bookshelves right now with an amazing book called Forever Strong, and I will put a link in the show notes to this book. It's a must read. I read this book over the summer. She actually sent me a copy before it was released, and I, I read it over the summer. It is a life-changing book. She has an incredible message. Um, she is a physician of the thing that I love about her. She's actually out there in the world really practicing what she preaches on real live human beings. And so welcome to the podcast, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon. Thank you so much for having me. What a uh, wonderful introduction. I'm so um, pumped to have you here. And I'm, we, you were just on my uh, water fasting challenge. You came in as a surprise guest. We had about 50,000 people. We just took through a water fasting challenge the other day. We're going to do another one later in the year. You had um, you know amazing information for the guests. Um, I want to talk a little bit about your journey, your message. I actually want to get into some of the main points of Forever Strong. Um, I, you know, before the, the cameras started rolling today, we were having a conversation and I said, um, I love your messaging because in our industry, I feel like there's a lot of super woke biohackers talking to other super woke biohackers. And I always say that's not our audience. Our audience are, is the masses. You've got an amazing message for the masses. And you know, some of the topics, by the way, covered in this book, burning fat, heart disease, reversing diabetes, staying sharp, building muscle, and boosting energy. So if you're not interested in any of those things, <laughs> please stop watching. Um, <laughs> That's right. So, so talk to me a little bit about, um, you know, your journey. You're an osteopathic physician. Yes. So you already had this sort of wellness orientation. I had this wellness orientation from the very beginning, mm -hmm. which makes this story unusual. I graduated high school in three and a half years, and I moved in with my godmother, Liz Lipsky. Do you know who that okay. is? Liz Lipsky. I, I, it, it just sounds like a famous name. I don't even know her, but <laughs> no, it's no, a cool no. name. So, Liz Lipsky. But, but, uh, functional medicine it has now, you know, it has legs to stand on now. But the generation before functional medicine was a thing. They were a handful of providers mm -hmm. and practitioners. Oh, yeah. My godmother was one of those. Wow. Yeah. And so I, what an amazing mentor. Yes. And I moved in with her when I was 17. Okay. And I sat in while she was seeing patients and I just saw how nutrition transformed their lives. Mm -hmm. And I realized that that was something that I wanted to do. And at that time, that was a very sort of tree hugger, granola, it was totally, way in left field kind of approach that totally. nutrition could have any impact on aging and longevity. I mean, to, to this day, it's astounding how many patients my clinical team sees and that are discharged from like oncology treatments and it says dietary restrictions, none. Right. I'm like, none? <laughs> Beer? Uh, you know, pasta? Uh, you know, Dunkin' Donuts? No, no restrictions at all? Right. So, so this kind of helped shape. Oh, beginning. it was, it was a huge driver because you're pointing out that there's a huge dichotomy between sick care and wellness. Mm -hmm. And I started seeing these patients come in and I sat with her. She saw patients who had had cancer, saw patients who had had eating disorders, all kinds of things. Right. And I realized that that was the direction I wanted to go. 
That's awesome. And I went to the University of Illinois where mm -hmm. I happened, I don't know how much you believe in serendipity, but I oh, huge. stumbled into the class of Dr. Donald Lehman. Oh, wow. And Dr. Donald Lehman is a world-class protein researcher. No doubt. And much of the information that we think about protein now came out of his lab mm. very early on. Okay. And I learned from him and I became obsessed. I became obsessed with this nutritional science mm. perspective. But I don't know how much you know about Illinois. Have you been to Illinois? Yeah, I actually went to grad school in Illinois. I went to I went to National College of Chiropractic, which is now National University of Health Sciences. So that's where, that's where I got my human biology degree. Terrible place in the winter. Okay, I, this is for, uh, this I learned is where to believe in seasonal affective disorder up there. I thought it was a bunch of nonsense until I lived in Chicago. And... Exactly. So I'm about to tell you how I then went to osteopathic school. Okay. So. I'm at University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, mm -hmm. where there is nothing but school and cornfields, mm -hmm. right? Gross, right. not fun. There was a tornado, <clears throat> uh, essentially a tornado warning. Okay. And we all, I was in nutrition class and we all had to go to this fallout shelter. And I must have been in that shelter for what felt like hours. Okay. And I sat there and I'm like, I'm totally useless. And that's mm. my greatest fear in life. Right. Is being not able to be useful to right. other people. Yeah. And, I, and I thought to myself, well, I can tell them to have an apple or eat some steak, but that's about it. Right. And it was at that moment I decided to go to medical school. Okay. And I chose osteopathic school because I was very interested in the musculoskeletal system. Mm. I was very interested in training at the time. I looked at MD school. I looked at DO school. And I looked at naturopathic school. Mm-hmm. And I chose osteopathic school. Okay. And where did, where was this? Arizona. In, in Arizona. Okay. So you go to osteopathic school in Arizona, you get out. Um, you know, Kicking and screaming. You sort of own this space, muscle-centric medicine. Yep. I actually stole a phrase of yours, muscle is our metabolic currency. I use that one all the time because <laughs> I think it really, nothing's more true than that statement. But how did you continue to gravitate towards you know, you say all the time, you know, muscle is the largest organ in the mm -hmm. body. Nobody thinks of muscle as an organ. That's right. I think. And it's the greatest organ in the body. And how is our muscle a part of an anti-aging and a longevity strategy? It's actually everything. And I had this aha moment. So I, I went to medical school. I did two years of residency at the University of Louisville in psychiatry. Oh, wow. And then I changed from psychiatry to family medicine and I did family medicine residency, and then I did a fellowship. Okay. And I did a fellowship in geriatrics and obesity medicine. Mm -hmm. So here is what happened. I don't know if uh, you've been exposed to geriatrics or end of life. Have you been Never exposed to that? Never directly. It, it is. M my kids are in nursing school, and they do rotations at the hospice. And they probably and come back, and they say, wow, that was so depressing and so challenging and oh, very difficult. Mentally and physically just exhausted my son, my daughter, blank face. Yes. Don't even want to talk about it. Now, imagine doing that for two years, seeing anywhere from 30 patients a day. And in the mornings and in the evenings, I was doing obesity research. Hmm. I worked on a project where I was looking at body composition and brain function. And I fell in love with one of these participants. We'll just call her Betty. Okay. You know, and Betty. Betty. Shout out to Betty. Is she still with us? <laughs> um, I, I don't know because Betty, she's if you're a, there. A, <laughs> Shut up. a research participant. <laughs> she was a mom of three in her mid fifties. Okay. She had done exactly what the medical system had told her to do. The food guide pyramid, um, eat less, exercise more, just do cardiovascular activity. Mm -hmm. And she struggled with the same 30, 20 to 30 pounds her entire life. Mm -hmm. Did she lose weight? Totally. She mm -hmm. lost weight. She regained it. She lost weight. It's the story that we've seen a million times. Right. I imaged her brain and her brain looked like the beginning of an Alzheimer's brain. Wow. In her fifties. Mm -hmm. Wow. And I think a lot like you, I was mortified. I felt very responsible. I felt that as a medical community, we were doing her a disservice and the information that she was provided was the same information that everyone was getting. Right. And I thought to myself, what are we missing? We're obviously missing something. Went to the hospital, started to think about this, saw the patients in the hospital bed, went to the dementia clinic, 
went to the nursing home on the weekends. Mm. And I realized that the one thing that all of these patients had in common was not that they were over fat, mm -hmm. but was that they were under muscled. Wow. And it was the health of their skeletal muscle that was determining the trajectory of their life. And so these were, these were in, later in life, there's something called sarcopenia, right. right? Age related muscle wasting. And I've, I've seen cross sections, um, you know, in human biology, we, 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 we had a cadaver anatomy lab and you could see as people got older, sometimes the diameter like of their thighs wouldn't Absolutely. change, but the composition would change. You'd, you, you'd see the musculature becoming increasingly less and the fat becoming increasingly more. And it wasn't noticeable externally, but is when we would dissect these cadavers, you could see that the older they were, they, the, the more sarcopenic, the more yep. they had, had muscle wasting. And that happens, so it's sarcopenic obesity, and there is this fat infiltration in skeletal muscle, intramyocellular fat, intramyocellular lipids. Mm -hmm. But the thing that's so interesting is that the skeletal muscle ends up looking like a marbled steak. Mm. And if we believe that skeletal muscle is metabolic currency, mm -hmm. which we do, it's the only yep. currency that you have to earn, by right. the way, you can't bargain for it, Botox it, or do any of these other things. There's no chemical, there's no synthetic, That's there's right. no pharmaceutical for you, it. You have to earn skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is the site for glucose disposal. Everybody cares about carbohydrates, where it's going to go. People care about insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. We've all heard about insulin resistance. People care about lipids, triglycerides. Skeletal muscle is the primary site for glucose disposal, fatty acid oxidation. Mm. It is an amino acid reservoir. All of these things is a secretory organ. But the reality is we think about diseases like cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease, as diseases of aging. Mm. But I would argue they're diseases of skeletal muscle. Wow, or lack thereof. Or lack thereof wow. that begin decades earlier. So let's say you're, you know, Peter Atia, Dr. Atia also talks about this. You know, your, your centenarian decathlon, I think he calls it, you know, your plan for what do you want to be doing when you're 100 years old? Because you've got a plan for it now. If you're in your 30s, right. your 40s, your 50s, your 60s. So, um, you know, m most of my audience is between the ages of 25 and 48 years old. They're, they're conscious about their health. Um, you know, they know something about exercise. Most of them are slightly woke to some biohacking methods. But if you're going to start on a good anti-aging muscle building program, like where do you start? I love this question. I think we should think about exercise mm -hmm. as a non-negotiable. Exercise mm. is an, a non-negotiable. 24% of Americans meet their recommendations for both cardiovascular activity and strength training. 24%? <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. 50% of Americans don't even work out. Yeah. Where would someone start? We have to think about exercise is that we're not training to become better at exercise. We're training to become better at life. What are the things that we have to do? Definitely resistance training three days a week. You start with one day upper body, one day lower body, mm -hmm. and a combination. The question becomes, what should people ultimately do? And I believe people should be doing movements that translate to real life. I think it's a great idea. Whether yeah. it's a kettlebell carry and people will say, well, I don't have kettlebells, then pick up gallons of water. Right. People will also say, I don't want to lift heavy weights because I'm going to get bulky. That's my favorite. My toddler, <laughs> one of my toddlers is 40 pounds. Really? <laughs> I am lifting her up all day long. Right. And same with all the moms. Nobody's getting bulky from that. Right. Right. These are, these are strong girl numbers. You have to be able to lift up your toddler and put your suitcase overhead. Yeah. So individuals should be training at least three days a week, resistance training. Okay. You know, I, I like to have them do between eight to 12 reps, but again, it depends on the uh, weight, the intensity, if they are new at resistance exercise, but that's just a blanket. But non-negotiable minimum three days a week yeah. of, of resistance training. Yes, I'm if you want to age well. Yeah. If you don't care about falling, breaking a hip, if you don't care about improving the quality of your life, being able to be, be strong because we have to plan for this sarcopenic experience. Mm -hmm. Because it's coming. I mean, so age-related muscle wasting is coming for all of us. Even if we can offset it by dietary protein and training, mm -hmm. there are changes within skeletal muscle that do happen. These type 2 muscle fibers change. 
the diameter changes. Yeah. The you'd mentioned the contractile ch- uh, proteins change. You get fat infiltration. Right. This stuff happens. And so you know a lot of people are you know you get to a certain age maybe it's your fifties your sixties certainly in your seventies where you go well why bother right because maybe I can maintain, but I certainly cannot improve. And I think you would take issue with that. Yeah. Right? The evidence doesn't, the, the evidence does not support that. It doesn't support that we can't build muscle even Correct. in later stages of life. Even so I'm 60 85. years old. I'm relatively sedentary. I can, there is hope for me to not only become more mobile and strong, but to actually put on lean muscle. Yes. Great. And by the way, the best time to start was yesterday, but you know, the better time to start is now. Oh, yeah. No, now is the time. I mean, well, like right now. <laughs> at this moment, drop and give yeah. me 50. I have a gym right next to my bedroom. <laughs> he does. It's so. amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. But people think and, that they're, what's the point? That I'm getting older even when they hit menopause. I've hit menopause. There's nothing yeah. I can do. None of that is true. You can always become stronger. You can always become more capable. Mm-hmm. And skeletal muscle is this organ of longevity. You know, it's interesting that grip strength was directly related to yeah. longevity. When I was in the mortality space, we would study all kinds of uh, in- indications and factors later in life that would actually have a demonstrative effect on your your longevity, your lifespan. Some of those were, you know, losing a spouse. We uh, called it broken heart syndrome, caregiver syndrome. When one spouse falls ill, and you put yourself in the back seat, stop taking care of yourself to take care of somebody else. But interestingly, in the majority of the hip fractures that we saw. Um, these elderly patients weren't falling and breaking their hip. That's right. Um, you know, their hip was breaking and then they were falling. And I found that astounding. Um, and so what you're saying is, you know, if you're, if you're doing weight training, you're also doing skeletal training, right? Because when we load a bone, that's right. It strengthens when we tear a muscle, it grows. Mm -hmm. So if you get in that kind of this double whammy, right? Because you're, if you're doing some kind of, weight training you're also doing skeletal training you're pushing off osteopenia that's right maybe osteoporosis and you're becoming more functional i mean the fact that grip strength and and people go why does grip strength matter well because when you're falling or you're going up stairs or you're holding a rail and you're not strong enough to support your weight down you go you know, and Murphy's Law says you're going to fall at the top of the steps, uh, right? You're never going to fall at the bottom. Do not do that. We're not <laughs> recommending that for anybody. Uh, um, so I broke down some of the chapters of your book because, um, you know, uh, you, you talk about being aware of the science. Um, so let's maybe take a little dive into some of what the science says about, you know, um, muscle being your metabolic currency and, you know, muscle actually being a component of a longer, healthier, happier lifestyle. Yeah. Hey guys, I think the most important website you may ever go to is theultimatehuman.com. That's theultimatehuman.com because on this website, we can directly interact with one another. You can give me suggestions for podcast guests and topics that you'd like to see me cover. You can ask me any question that you'd like. More importantly, you can sign up for my entirely free newsletter. It comes out every single week. I write this so I can get the information to the masses on how to live a healthier, happier, longer, chemical-free life. You can also sign up for a pre-order of my book. And if you'd like to take the genetic test that I talk about all the time, it's available there too. And lastly, you can even see all of the products that I use in my daily life for a chemical-free, healthy living style. A lot of people ask me, you know, what do you use in your daily life, Gary? What do you brush your teeth with and clean your countertops with? Well, it's all there if you'd like to see it. And you can, again, ask me any question that you'd like and get my free newsletter theultimatehuman.com. I promise you that information will help change the trajectory of your life. And now back to the Ultimate Human Podcast. I mean, one of the first things that we have to think about is there's very few things in medicine that overarchingly benefit a person where we can say the more healthy skeletal muscle mass you have, the greater your survivability Mm. against nearly all causes of death. Wow. And we can say that about skeletal muscle. You know, and I was thinking about this. I was looking at the CDC and I was looking at the top causes of death, which um, I'm sure that you have looked at for many decades. Very well versed. (laughs) What is so interesting is it will say things like Alzheimer's, cardiovascular disease, cancer, all of those. It won't say anything about skeletal muscle. Oh, no, it doesn't. But at the root of all of those things. I don't think it's even in the top 20. No. The root of all of those things 
is the health of skeletal muscle. Mm. And the whole perspective is wrong. We've been chasing this obesity epidemic for the last 50 years. It's gotten worse. We've gotten worse. Yeah. And the narrative and the way in which we speak about it is incorrect. We're constantly focused on what we have to lose mm -hmm. rather than what we have to gain. And if we believe that skeletal muscle is this organ of longevity, mm -hmm. if we believe that the more healthy skeletal muscle mass you have, the greater you'll be able to regulate carbohydrate metabolism, the better your fatty acid oxidation will be, the stronger you will be. Mm. You and I were talking offline about, about mitochondrial health. Yes, the healthier your muscle is. Well, the more muscle you have, the more mitochondria there, you have. So there you, there you have it. Mm. And one of the things that makes muscle sick is this lack of flux. If you think about muscle as a suitcase. So okay. let's make it really simple. Right. If you open up a suitcase and you pack it all up and you're going on a trip for four days, but you pack for 30, you're right. eating all this food, everything is flowing out everywhere. You can't get all the clothes back in. You can't even get the clothes in. It's a mess everywhere. Sounds like my wife preparing <laughs> to go away for I mean, one night. We all, yeah. we all do that. She's got good taste. She's beautiful. She's got great taste, taste, but good Lord, is she a terrible packer. <laughs> so, so if you think about skeletal muscle as a suitcase, when it is overpacked, then everything remains in the bloodstream. Glucose has nowhere mm. to go. You become more insulin resistant. Fatty acids increase. And- Skeletal muscle at its core is responsible for these diseases that we're seeing later on in life. You know, it was it's astounding how much sedentary lifestyle uh, was connected to all cause mortality. In the mortality space, um, you know, sitting became the new smoking. Mm -hmm. And for the first time in modern history, in measured mortality history, life expectancy is beginning to go backwards. And I found that astounding right as my career was starting to trail out, um, the career in, in mortality was beginning to end. You know, the evidence was coming out that, um, you know, all of this spending on healthcare is not helping us live longer. I mean, we're, in the United States, we're the number one spender in healthcare worldwide by a massive factor. We're ranked 52nd in the world in life expectancy. We're ranked 38th in healthcare delivery. And the one thing that stood out was sedentary lifestyle. And, you know, so, I mean, people need to start now with a, with a program. One of the things you talk about in your, in your book is building a comprehensive strategy. Um, I love the, you know, the takeaway that, um, exercise is non-negotiable. And if you haven't been exercising for a period of time, you could start with what, just body weight exercises, push-ups, squats, planks. I love yeah. it. It doesn't have to be complicated mm -hmm. to be effective. Right. You don't need a trainer. You don't need a fancy gym. No. I mean, you can actually really hurt yourself with uh, with body weight exercises. I mean, there are some trainers that could just take you through. Ben Greenfield came and stayed with me for a few days, and we went out in the park and destroyed ourselves with just, you know, good mornings and rotation exercises and whatnot. So it's not as complicated as it sounds, but I think making it non-negotiable is... I think something is a big takeaway for people. And I don't know, Gary, I don't know how we're going to do it because when you think about it, we know that skeletal muscle is so important in all of these things. Mm -hmm. Yet 50% of Americans are not exercising. How do we then move the needle? And I think the only way to really get them to switch on is number one, it's not about the person. If you're not willing to do it for yourself, you have to be willing to do it for another individual, like a family member, <clears throat> excuse me. But <clears throat> the other thing to do is also embracing this discomfort mm -hmm. that expect that maybe you're not going to want to do it, Yeah, but that you have to embrace discomfort. Yeah. Aging is the aggressive pursuit of comfort. Yeah. I really think that that's true. I sort of coined that phrase because I think the more aggressively we pursue comfort, the faster we age. Um, you don't even, your feet don't even ah. touch the ground. <laughs> So just so everybody knows, I'm five so foot one, she's uh, five one. I, 110 pounds, maybe I need a booster seat next time for round two. I, I, I felt a, so bad. I was like, her feet don't even touch the a, ground. A booster chair. <laughs> I would have gotten you a booster chair if I, if I, if I had known. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, aging is this aggressive pursuit of comfort and, you know, we, we just do not like being uncomfortable, cold showers, you know, It's exercise. the great equalizer. Age is the great equalizer. Mm. Muscle decline starts in your 30s. 
you know, these diseases that we have to overcome, they're not diseases of later in life. Sarcopenia is not a late life disease. I didn't know that. We, sarcopenia begins in your 30s. Wow, I did not know. Well, sarcopenia you, is age-related muscle wasting. So. Exactly. And if you are an active, you will lose skeletal muscle. Insulin resistance, you can see that at 18. Gerald, Gerald Schulman did some of the early work. It's crazy out of in our clinic. We're seeing it. Yeah, younger and younger. With Metabolic no, syndrome. With also with no outward signs of obesity. Mm -hmm. You can not look overweight and have unhealthy skeletal muscle. I don't disagree with that at all. Now, so there's two, two sides to this, right? One is, okay, exercise is going to become non-negotiable. There are so many different recommendations for protein out there. Sources of protein, types of protein, amounts of protein, half a kilogram per body weight, kilogram, I mean, an ounce per or gram per kilogram of body weight. Where do you fall in this maze of protein recommendations? First, I would like to say that I trained in nutrition. So the first thing people will say is physicians are not trained in nutritional science. Mm -hmm. Fair? They say yes. they get seven hours. I've trained seven years in nutritional wow. sciences. Okay. Dedicated training in nutritional sciences from one of the world leading experts and then went to a lab at Washington University. Okay. Wow. In St. Louis to do a fellowship in nutritional sciences. Okay. Now let's talk about protein. Yes. Protein is the black sheep of the macronutrient family. And by the way, it wasn't like that when I started my training. It wasn't. No. So I've been studying this uh, for almost two decades. It wasn't like that. Yeah. I mean, we turned the food pyramid upside down yeah, at some point. It, it wasn't like that. Yeah. And the recommendation for dietary protein is 0.8 grams per kilogram. Okay. The RDA is the minimum to prevent deficiencies. The minimum to prevent deficiencies, this number is based on nitrogen balance, which mm -hmm. nitrogen balance is, is, was originally used in agriculture to figure out how to feed animals with it, the cheapest way possible. Ah, uh -huh. um, so Not in surprising. order to right, in order to continue their growth, what is the cheapest way that we could feed animals with the lowest amount of protein? They'll still grow. We extrapolated some of this data. We created it for eighteen-year-old men, young men, and they determined 0.8 grams per kilogram. Okay, and this is a maintenance amount of protein. No, this is the minimum for eighteen-year-old males to prevent deficiencies. Okay. That recommendation has not been updated since easily the 80s. Wow. Now, let me ask you this. The minimum to prevent deficiencies, this number is also based on high quality protein. There's a difference between proteins. There's high quality protein, which are uh, animal-based proteins. Right. This is not an emotional discussion. This is purely based on the amino acids. Right. That's it. I, I, by the way, I agree with you. I'm a uh, huge fan of grass-fed meats, wild-caught fish. Pasture-raised chickens, pasture-raised eggs. I do not believe that these are the devil foods that they're No, they never have been. And then low-quality protein would be plant-based proteins. Okay. And again, I am not making a judgment whether you eat one or the other. I am also not- I think by low-quality, you mean low percentage of absorption per, per gram. Per percentage, percentage of absorption. And also the amino acid profiles are different. Mm. So if you were to look at quinoa and a chicken breast, the percentage of these amino acids are different. We don't eat for protein. We eat for amino acids. Right. There are 20 different amino acids, nine of which are essential. And we eat for those nine essential amino acids. Which means they're essential for life. If you don't yeah. get these nine amino acids, you'll die. That's right. Right. And when we talk about protein, we have to understand we're talking about protein as an overarching number, mm -hmm. but that really does miss the food matrix, which we'll eventually get to. Okay. The current recommendation is 0.8 grams per kilogram, which comes out to... 0.37 grams per pound that you're assimilating that you that would be the recommendation to prevent deficiency wow so if you are a 115 pound person that minimum would be 45 grams of protein oh my gosh nothing that's nothing and people take this as a maximum now let's look at it from the scope of vitamin c if 60 milligrams of vitamin c is the recommended dietary allowance and you were sick would you go, oh, that's enough. The 60 milligrams is enough. Would you no. ever say that? No. You, no. Anybody who gets sick or feels that they have a cold coming on, they might take, I don't know, three times that, a hundred times that. Right. Two, well, I mean, whatever it is. But we don't think about protein in that perspective. Right. It's not just enough to eat protein, obviously. You got to 
you 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 got the muscles got to ask for it so if you're damaging the muscle and it's asking for the protein now you're growing the muscle so you're talking about you know deficiency i would imagine the minimum amount for deficiency is just so you can Survive. survive. But look at what has happened. So if the average protein intake, and this is according to NHANES data, the largest data set that we have, the average female eats around 68 grams of protein a day. The average male is maybe around 100. Mm. When we think about how do we support aging, skeletal muscle requires two main things. It requires a stimulus through exercise and it requires dietary protein. Skeletal muscle changes as we age. The efficiency of protein utilization goes down. The capillary blood flow decreases. There's um, anabolic resistance that happens, meaning the skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is a nutrient sensing organ, mm. and it senses the quality of the diet. In it does. yes, in particular, it senses the amino acids. It it senses um, high quality proteins. Okay, like leucine. We'll, we can talk about uh, leucine is not a high quality protein, but it senses amino acids. The amino acids, the leucine, yeah. isoleucine, valine. Exactly, the branch chain amino acids, mm -hmm. and it's particularly sensitive to leucine. As we age, this sensitivity decreases. Okay. But we need it because you're talking about hypertrophy and muscle getting stronger and turning over. We need to overcome what happens with aging to maintain the health of skeletal muscle. Mm. We do that through training, and we do it through dosing of dietary protein, which will lead me to what I recommend. I recommend close to one gram per pound ideal body weight. Oh, one gram per pound, not per kilogram, per pound Correct. of body weight. Correct. Okay. So one gram, per, and you could go anywhere from 0.7 to one gram per pound. So I'm 195 pounds. You'd recommend I get 195 grams of protein today. Right. Well, okay. you could go a little Perfect. bit lower because right. you're very active. Um, but at the high end. Stop it. <laughs> Dr. Lyon. I'm telling you, he did like 200 push-ups right before we started. See that? Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, so that is a, again, that might be a lot for some people, but the, and, and we have to be careful about how we talk about it. People will say, well, that's a high protein diet. It's on the higher end, but double the RDA at 0.7 grams, which would be 1.6 grams per kg is not a high protein diet. Mm. That's a more optimal protein right. diet. And okay. I, I think that, you know, we talk about, oh, this is a high protein diet. Well, no, it's not if you're comparing it to- Because everybody says, you know, the high protein diets, they put stress on the kidneys. They no. put, But I think that has to do with, if you're just shoveling in a bunch of protein and you're sedentary, probably would put a lot of stress on your kidneys. But if you're shoveling in a lot of protein, which becomes amino acids, and you're not sedentary, well, and then that protein has a place to go. And I would say that we use these amino acids for a whole host of other things. These amino acids, they're unique- um, molecules yeah. that are used for various things, whether it's protein turnover or neurotransmitters, there's, uh, you know, tryptophan for serotonin production, right. there's threonine for mucin production in your gut. You talk a lot about tyrosine, phenylalanine, exactly. For dopamine. Exactly. Yeah. So these people have to understand that these proteins are not interchangeable. We require high quality proteins to do all these other things. But the cool thing is that the liver is so intelligent that it can take these proteins and chop them up into one other necessary ones that it needs. I remember when I was in high school and even in college, the big thing, like the big breakthrough was branch chain amino acids, BCAAs, you know, leucine, isoleucine, valine. And, um, and so all these BCAA powders started coming out and it was like all you needed <clears throat> to be, you know, Super fit was to be to looking PCAs. like Arnold Schwarzenegger. This is yeah, it. This is yeah. all you need. That was the secret. And um, and I've been and, trying that for a very long time, and it's not worked. It's yet. not worked. Yeah, <laughs> but you're talking about the full spectrum of amino yeah, acids. Yeah, so you need right? the full spectrum. The way that I I think about branch chains, and I actually don't recommend branch chains alone, just sipping throughout the day, mm -hmm. because you do need the full spectrum. So if you're going to start the machinery, then you need everything to lay down tissue. Yeah, you know, I I, I have like kind of a secret rule of thumb that if you, you know, when you're developing a supplement or you're looking for a supplement to take, you know, how close is it to how it would naturally occur? I think that's nature? a great idea. Right. I'm thinking, what could I eat or drink, you know, naturally found on the surface of the earth somewhere out in nature that just has branch chain amino acids in a two to one to one ratio, leucine to isoleucine to valine. And I have you found it? No, I haven't. It's like there's no have fish found that it? only has that, you know, yeah. there's no plant that only right. contains that. So, you know, I find it hard to believe that 
you know, because we've been able to isolate these in a laboratory, that that's now the secret. Right. I think when things are the way they're presented in nature and meats, for example, full spectrum of, of amino acids, um, if you're going to supplement, supplement it with a full spectrum of amino acids. I mean, I, t I work out fasted, but I take something called perfect aminos, um, which is Dr. Minkoff. And uh, I take this before I work out and I take it right after I work out. I think it has two calories in it, so it doesn't really break my fast. And I can absolutely tell the difference between taking that and not taking it and how I feel before, during, and after mm -hmm. a workout. And there is some, you know, some people do really well with intra-workout amino acids. Mm -hmm. And again, this is actually a full spectrum amino acid or a full spectrum amino acid mixture. So mm -hmm. you are getting everything you need. So let's, let's talk about uh, a typical, you know, morning routine and, it, and, and, is in your opinion, is there a better time of the day to work out? You know, I always actually feel stronger late in the day, but the, the truth is I usually rarely have time to work right. out in the day. So I'm selfish in the mornings because I say the first 60 to 90 minutes of every day belongs to me. You are lucky. And then I give the rest of the day away, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, I, uh, you are very lucky. Okay. Um, so for the, the listener who doesn't know, I have a two and a half year old. Oh, and a four and a half year old and a, you don't get a lot of your uh, own time and yeah. <laughs> zero and a husband who is a, a medical resident, okay. a surgical resident, actually. Um, let's talk about a morning routine. It really depends. I, I think you can always have a morning routine if you're willing to get up earlier than everybody else. Wow. My husband wakes up at four before I came here. I woke up at four. Okay. I got my workout in. Before I, I got here. Wow. Did you fly in today? Yeah, I did. You did? She flew in. So I got, so I I got up. So Are you ready for this? Yeah. I got up, got up at 4 a.m. Mm -hmm. for my husband, which is a big deal. He always yeah. wakes up at 4. I hit the gym, got dressed, left at 6 a.m., come here. I've already knocked out my workout. So you, you, you your gym is down the street from your house? We have a gym in our house. Oh, you have a gym in your yeah. house. Okay. So, so and by the way, I got, to have a gym in your house is not like, no. you, isn't that to be LA Fitness? No. So right. here's what I did this morning. So today was actually an off day for me. Okay. Um, and so what I did was 20 minutes of high intensity interval. Uh, uh, we did a Peloton. I did a Peloton. I said, okay. I did a Peloton um, because I typically try to at least get one day of high intensity interval training. Okay. And then I have weights and I do goblet squats. I do some kind of carry, mm -hmm. some kind of push up because, you know, in our household, if you have little kids, they love to get on your back. So I really yeah. got to be on my push up. Okay. Game. I love that. I love the push up game. Um, so if you're willing to get up early, you will always have a morning routine mm -hmm. and it doesn't have to be complicated. So I trained with a red light on. Okay. Train with a red light. I use, you know, some sodium right mm -hmm. after. I'm a huge, huge believer in sodium too. Yep. I think the majority of people, from seeing thousands and thousands and thousands of labs uh, come through our clinic, you know, they're actually sodium deficient, not they're not having an I think excess there is of sodium. A, I, I think that that's a really interesting point that you bring up. I think that, so sodium is so tightly controlled, but there is, I, I do actually agree with you. Mm. There is some evidence that it's, you know, we think that we have to be so restrictive on sodium, right. but it, uh, again, I, I think there's other evidence that support supports that potentially we do need more sodium. Yeah, and I and I talk about not iodized table salt, but like Celtic salts, uh, Baja gold salts, you yeah. know, pink Himalayan sea salt. I mean, recently I've been reading some literature about uh, the amount of heavy metals coming in pink Himalayan sea salts, especially yeah. from China. So I've steered towards Celtic sea salt. But it is amazing how simply adding a mineral salt, like a Celtic sea salt or Baja salt to your drinking water in the morning, how many... Again, patients coming through our clinic report um, less muscle aches, um, less muscle spasms, a complete cessation of mm -hmm. calf spasms, even a significant reduction in migraine headaches. And yep. there was a clinical study I talked about on one of my podcasts where they found an inverse relationship between sodium and migraine headaches because of the dural covering of the brain, mm -hmm. um, stretching or contracting improperly because of the sodium in imbalance. Wow. So, so you, you add a little sodium to your water in the mornings. Okay. So you I got up this morning, smashed it, and then you got on a plane. Got on a plane. And actually after this, I'm heading home. Yeah. Wow. That's great. A little round trip just to be on the <laughs> ultimate human podcast. That's awesome. <laughs> um, <laughs> hey guys, if you've been watching the ultimate human podcast for any length of time, you know that one thing I do not do is push products. I do not just let any advertiser into this space because I believe that the products that appear on the ultimate human podcast should be things that I use every day in my life to improve my own physiology. 
One of them is something called the Echo Go Plus. The Echo Go Plus is a hydrogen water generator that you can take on the go. You essentially take the top off of this bottle, you pour bottled water in this, and repeatedly it will make high part per million hydrogen water. You press this little button, you'll see these bubbles going up in the water. That's hydrogen being created in the water. There are all kinds of peer-reviewed published clinical studies on the benefits of hydrogen water, including reduced inflammation, better absorption of your supplements, better absorption of your foods, better balance of the stomach acid, and it feeds an entire class of bacteria in your gut. Hydrogen water, in my opinion, is the most beneficial water that you can drink, and now you can take it wherever you go. You can go to Echo, E-C-H-O, h2o.com that's echo echo h2o.com enter the code ultimate 10 for a discount echo h2o entered the code ultimate 10 for a discount and now back to the ultimate human podcast so massive weight loss craze going on Crazy. right now and you know <laughs> a year and a half ago ish um wagovi azampic manjaro um or semaglutide or semiglutide, depending on how you say it, and terzepatide hit the market. Massive weight loss drugs, great for people with type 2 diabetes and obesity, but a lot of people are using it for vanity. Um, and what are what is your opinion on these? Um, lots of you know anecdotal stories about people lose muscle mass and lean body mass in addition to the fat, they get a zempic face. Um, what is your position on these weight loss drugs? First question, do we really believe it's vanity? If you have fat to lose, is it is it vanity? Is mm. having excess adipose tissue healthy? No. It's one of the signs of metabolic syndrome. So I would say even if someone has a small amount of weight to lose and maybe they've really struggled, mm -hmm. you know, I think it's important to have the experience of I'm a provider that has seen thousands of patients. There is only so much struggle that as a provider, you're willing to accept for your patients. Right. That if you have a tool, you should be able to use it. Okay. Um, and the treatment should match the severity of the challenge. So I'll give you a, an example. Let's say someone has 10 pounds to lose. They've had 10 pounds for the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And now we have a medication that, by the way, that we can titrate up or down, you know, whether it's uh, ozempic or trizepatide, you know, whether it's semaglutide or trizepatide. And I think that the provider and the patient should have the opportunity to use it. Okay. Now, the statement that I'm seeing that's been all over is that when you go on these medications, these peptides, that you will lose skeletal muscle mass as if it's a thing. Mm -hmm. If it's a foregone conclusion. You're now- saying. We put patients on the on these drugs all the time, and we do not see that. Okay. We insist that they have high quality protein, and we insist that they do resistance training. Okay. Those individuals, what we see is high quality weight loss, mostly adipose tissue. We see correction in their blood markers as well as maintenance of skeletal muscle mass. Now, if it was true that these medications, these peptides affected skeletal muscle, then we have to be able to give a mechanism of action. Mm. What is a mechanism of action? I, 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 would, I would have to say that they're just in such a caloric deficit and their appetite shut off so much that they're beginning to metabolize lean muscle. But, you know, ironically, we don't see that in our clinic either. Um, so. Dr. Sard, our clinic director, does the same thing that you do. Um, resistance training, high quality protein diet, and, and use of other peptides, generally the growth hormone peptides like sermorelin. Or CJC um, maybe. Or CJC-1295, ipamorelin, if you can still get those, you know, the FDA. <laughs> That's is, right. I, oh my gosh, I forgot about that. Yeah. That's right. In November, the FDA, did, I think they also took off BPC, CJ, yeah. like all of them. A shame, BPC-157. Yeah. It's yeah. so many patients on that yep. for tissue repair and yes. injury. Um, I hope that that one is still allowed to be produced, um, you know, in the... Uh, you know, outside of compound yep. pharmacies. But so if, if someone's considering semaglutide, um, Wachovia mm -hmm. or Zampic, Terzepatide, Manjaro, um, for weight loss, you're for that, but you, the importance of maintaining healthy protein- Of course. And resistance training- Of course. May even be more important when you're on those and- Definitely. De possible and use of peptides. Definitely. And, and we do know that the high quality weight loss, and I worked on some of these earlier studies in the 2000s, when um, individuals would eat the food guide pyramid versus 
a double the RDA mm -hmm. protein diet, so 1.6 grams per kg. And we always saw when calories are controlled that those individuals that ate a protein forward diet, 1.6 grams per kg, plus little two days of like yoga like activity mm. and walking daily was enough to maintain skeletal muscle. Wow. Okay, so it that's was, good. It's such a minimal amount of stimulus. So I'm super, super happy to hear you say that. I'm sure a lot of people are happy to hear you say that because every, well, not everybody, but a lot of people have that last stubborn 10 or 15 pounds. It's been hanging out for so long and maybe this could get them over the edge. Yeah, um, and I will also not, say something else yeah. is when you hear a narrative where everybody is bashing something, I typically go the other way. Yeah. So pay attention. <laughs> here's, I get bashed online all the wait, time. But so. here's humans are really funny. <clears throat> they hear something repeated over and over again. And humans, if something is repeated enough, people believe it to be true mm -hmm. rather than it's just repetition. Yeah. That's the herd mentality. And, and we have to really take a step back and just challenge everything that you hear. So now let's go into um, diet a little bit. So we have an exercise is non-negotiable. Um, and, and by the way, everyone will look for an excuse. The reality is you have to know your human nature. You're going to, you're going to look for it. Right. Be wise to it. Yes. You know? Yeah. I mean, I remember when I st first started cold plunging. So I've strategically set up my, you know, you've seen it. I've strategically oh. set up my home so that I, it's I have amazing. This I don't know. You guys should really complain to management about this full <laughs> spectrum water view. You really need to upgrade this. Yeah. I have. I, Sage I, said, I better not say that because you'll get a, an idea. <laughs> I will get an idea. Now, if there's an ounce of space in my house, I put a piece of biohacking equipment there, but I play this little game with myself because I have my bedroom and then my bathroom and then there's the cold plunge and then the gym and then you go down the hallway, there's the red light bed and then the kitchen. It's so awesome. And so I have this little thing I do with myself where I kind of earn my way to the coffee maker. Um, and it works great. Because, and I've never regretted it. But And, and I used the David, David Goggins. I saw a podcast with him one time and he was like, stop negotiating with yourself. And, um, you know, I used to walk to the edge of the cold punch and I go, man. Maybe I should, maybe I should get my coffee. Maybe I should go do my breath work first. Totally. Now yeah, I just walk hilarious. over and I get in, you know? <laughs> and, and, you know, it just reminds me, you asked the question is what is the best time to exercise? Mm -hmm. And I was talking to Sachin Panda and uh, he is a circadian biologist and mm. he says it should be later on in the day. Right. Whether it's around I feel three to seven. See, I don't. If you put me in the gym between three and seven, I'm a disaster. Really? Disaster. Okay. You put me in the gym in the morning and I got it. Okay. So you're just conditioned for that. I think that there is probably um, personalized biology, certain circadian rhythms for people. Yeah. But I will tell you what. So that is what the data would support later right. on in the day, uh, according to Sachin. But for me, no. Well, I mean, th the fact is that I think the majority of people listening to this podcast know that if I if I schedule my workout later in the day, there's so many more things that can interrupt my totally. day. Because life just gets in the way. My dad, Captain John Brackett, used to say all the time, life is what happens to you when you're on your way to doing something else. It was like the greatest definition of life I, I think that. I ever heard. I yeah. love that. He's a simple man. He's a Navy captain, and, and, he, and he used to say that to me all the time as a kid. Life's what happens to you when you're on your way to doing something else. And, um, and it's true. And I think that you know, your, your day is going to get away from you. So I think you know, obviously scheduling your workouts in the morning is beyond the most beneficial time because then you're done and you feel amazing. Totally. about it. I've, I've never regretted working out in the morning. I've never regretted cold plunging in the morning. Um, I mean, you tell yourself it's a terrible idea when you're getting in, like, I can't believe I'm doing this. this is the worst idea ever. Yeah, yeah exactly. But, but then you, but man, you want to talk about the guilt of, of promising totally. yourself that you're going to get a hard workout in and then missing it four or five days Gary, in a row. Let's talk about the real key to longevity. Okay. You know what Let's it talk is? Self-discipline. That's exactly wow. what you're talking about. So discipline is more important than motivation. I mean, you were talking about the real key to longevity is you made a promise to yourself. You have integrity with yourself. And when you're out of alignment with that, mm. that's the real, everyone will always ask us, right? We mm. are um, practitioners. We are working with people and they will say, well, what's the key? What's the secret? Yeah. There is no biohacking hard work. Hmm. And meaning way to biohack hard work. It's just hard work. It's hard work. <laughs> yeah. It's hard work. There's no way to, you know, you're always reading, you're always looking at, at uh, studies and, and thinking about how you can better serve humanity. 
you can't, that takes a lot of time and energy. No doubt. You might love it, but it takes energy and focus and you can't shortcut that. No. The same thing with your body and mm -hmm. you shouldn't want to, you know, people are always looking, what is the, the hack or the, the shortcut? Um, yeah, maybe it's not fun that you and Ben did 5 million hours of whatever you did in the park. And maybe that ruck that's three hours, you could probably have done it faster if you used a contraption. But the reality is, is it teaches you and cultivates something different. Mm. And again, muscle is this currency that has to be earned. Right. It, yeah, it is. It is the one thing, no matter how wealthy you are, socioeconomic differences. I mean, you can't, you either do the work or you don't. You don't. So what's, What's a good healthy morning routine? What are some good high quality protein sources? I mean, you know, most of us, I think I know about eggs and red meat, but what are some high quality protein sources that people should have in their cabinets? What are some must haves for the refrigerator to have around so, so it's that easy. they can hit that protein target? Um, a, a great whey protein. Okay. A great whey protein, especially if you're a busy individual. Again, you don't have to cook it. Put mm -hmm. a scoop and a half in there, hit 30 grams or so of whey protein and you're good to go. Okay. I love that. I love that for fast, uh, a fast, uh, food. Also whey protein has lactoalbumin. It has lactoferrin. Mm -hmm. It has these immunoglobulins that help support gut health and body. It's amazing. Okay. So those are, uh, powders again, lean meats are great. Certified Piedmontese. If you had that, I told you I was going to send you some. Yeah, send me some. Although I mean, after I being here, I'm just, no, after being here, I said, I, Gary, I'm not sending you any presents. This place is amazing. <laughs> what is the point of me sending you anything? Sending it to Madison. Yeah, send but, it to Madison, um, my daughter. I, I, people mistake this idea of breakfast that it has to be something different. All of mm -hmm. a sudden, we decided breakfast was going to be cereal or oatmeal. It doesn't have to be that. It can be lean steak. That's what we eat in our house. Yeah. Uh, we also I have lean steak early breakfast. in the day all the time. Uh, we do eat Greek yogurt. We mm -hmm. eat a lot of eggs in my in my house. We eat but fish I'm not so crazy about, but for no other reason. Right. Turkey, chicken, have that for breakfast. Here's the other thing is you have to prep. Mm. Prep. Make sure it's just around. What is the one thing that 100% of people do unless you're doing a water fast for three days? Eat. Eat. Yeah. So you know you're going to be hungry. Know you have to do it. Plan for it. Right. Okay. I like that. So plan your meals Exercise is non-negotiable. Muscle 30 is to your 50, metabolic 30 currency. 30 to 50 grams of protein at that first meal. Okay. 30 to 50 grams yes, at the first meal. for overcoming anabolic resistance and for stimulating skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle as a nutrient sensing organ requires a dose response. Wow. So you mean if I had small, tiny amounts of protein throughout the day versus a bolus amount of protein, right. it's actually better to bolus dose Correct. the protein That's right. than it is to get micro doses of it throughout the day. Right. Because you will never reach that threshold. And I would say that that's one of the reasons why we see sarcopenia, which is that decrease in muscle mass mm -hmm. and function. And we see a lot of these diseases of aging because we can't maintain our, our muscle tissue. You know, it's, it's interesting that you bring that up because just anecdotally I've observed as my, my, my parents just literally just left here to go back to Tennessee. You had them down for the holidays. I've noticed that as they've gotten older, they become, have become snackers and not really meal people. Mm. And, you know, um, I, I'm doing this thing with my mom that I'm putting online, uh, showing how we're improving our cognitive function. A, lar a large part of what we're doing is, is getting her to be more mobile. Um, which is so important, but this is good. Yeah. This is good information that, you know, the bolus dosing of approach is better to actually sit down and eat a meal than it is to just nibble your way through the day. So the, the studies that support this and, and Don Lehman did Don Lehman and Doug Patton Jones, they did these early distribution studies. Uh, and there was some, a uh, French group that did it. And this idea of, you can have the same gram of protein. So you could have 75 grams of protein. Both people are eating 75 grams mm -hmm. of protein and muscle protein synthesis, which is the, it's a biomarker we use for skeletal muscle health is the incorporation of these amino acids and overall important for what we believe uh, as muscle health, that those that had a bolus meal mm -hmm. had higher levels of 24 hour muscle protein synthesis than someone who had 10 grams, seven times a day. Wow. Okay. And people have to really understand that if food is medicine, mm -hmm. we need to dose it appropriately. And especially as we age and that 30 to 50 grams of high quality protein 
stimulates muscle appropriately. I cover this in the book. It is, um, you know, there's three tracks in the book. There's a longevity track, there's a weight loss track and a hypertrophy track. I'd, I'd like to get on all three of those. <laughs> I know my audience is like, yes, yes. And yes. Um, <laughs> you don't just have to pick one, right? Right. Okay. Right. So what are some, what are some things? I'm a huge, um, like data nerd. And so I like data. You know, one of the things that we try to do in our clinics is give people data and sort of gamify their health journey. Love it. So what are some data points they could look at in their blood? Um, maybe some data points in body mass index, yep. uh, that they could look at and target, to kind of get on board with sort of gamifying this, Perfect. this, this journey. Um, when you are thinking about skeletal muscle health, we have to think about strength metrics. And most most physicians will not say, how many push-ups, how many squats can you do, how long is your dead hang? You actually should know those numbers. Mm. You have to think about skeletal muscle as this organ system, so we have to take a comprehensive approach. Number one, understanding where your strength is at. Number two, and listen, they do those in, they do some of these things in geriatric clinics where, you know, your walking test or your sit and stand or your grip strength. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. The other thing that you need to look at is things like fasting insulin. Fasting insulin. Five or less is okay. a great number. Fasting blood glucose and fasting insulin. Okay. You will see derangements in these things first before you may see pathology and skeletal muscle. So for people that are that are familiar with these numbers, so, you, so your fasting insulin, where do you want your fasting insulin to be? Around five. I mean, okay, it five. could be, so people will say, you know, 15 would be considered normal, but you know, between- That's up there. Right. So for me in my clinic, I, I like to see it around five. Okay. Now I don't like to see it low. People, and here's why. Sometimes when insulin numbers are too low, we worry about beta cell death. Mm -hmm. and beta cell dysfunction in mm -hmm. the pancreas. So, okay. I, you know, you do, that's why I think cyclical feeding of carbohydrates and these works are really cells well. cells that make insulin. Right, yeah. right, right. Beta cells that make um, insulin in the pancreas, yes. Okay, so five for insulin. Um, what about fasting glucose? So fasting glucose is a little tricky. Mm. And here's why, because I believe, my mentor Don Lehman believes that when you are on a more optimal protein diet, and I don't have data to support this, mm -hmm. that the red blood cells live a little bit longer. Mm. So over time, you might see a higher hemoglobin A1C. Ah. Uh, maybe you'll see a higher hemoglobin A1C. Maybe it's 5.6, 5.7, but insulin will be on the lower end, five or less. Single digits, okay. Single digits. This is interesting. And insulin, and I'm sorry, blood glucose might be anywhere, you know, it could be in the 90s, mm. which again, th that is creeping up upwards towards of being out of range. Yeah. Um, and it really depends on the person. You know, I've, it's, it's funny how many people, you know, we work with that will wake up fasted. Everybody wakes up fasted, but you wakes up, wake up fasted and they're wearing a constant glucose monitor. And before they even have coffee, they get up and they start moving around and they're like, my blood sugar is rising. How's my blood sugar rising and I'm not even eating? Right. Right. So there's the liver factor there right. too, right? Gluconeogenesis. Thro throwing yep. glucose into the bloodstream. Yep. Um, so I always tell them, hey, that's a good thing, yep. right? You, you Trust me, you're happy that that's happening. Um, <laughs> You'd be so, very cranky if it wasn't. So fasting glucose, hemoglobin A1C, three-month average of your blood sugar. Um, and triglyceride levels as well. Insulin triglycerides. Triglycerides. So we like to see triglycerides less than 100 um, you Excellent. know, we begin to see insulin resistance. We start to see derangement in all of these things. Okay. And talk, talk a little bit about cholesterol, because I think we have vilified cholesterol yeah. so much. And, um, you know, we say high LDL bad. And I will just say that from my experience in the longevity space and not the longevity space, the mortality space, we did not see during my career, hmm. a centenarian um, that at the time that they passed and we had blood work on, um, did not have what we would consider to be clinically elevated levels of LDL cholesterol. So what is your take on cholesterol, LDL cholesterol? Yeah, I, I think that, um, ApoB is a much better marker looking mm -hmm. at ApoB and triglyceride levels versus LDL cholesterol. Mm -hmm. Um, I do believe that we're going to start to see some of the guidelines change eventually mm -hmm. that people will start to care less about it. Um, Especially the LDL cholesterol yes. that it's like and, marginally high. Right. Bad. And also there's something else that I think it's really important to talk about is people will say, 
I'm concerned about eating eggs or red meat because of cholesterol. Mm -hmm. I don't believe that this is a cholesterol issue. I do not believe that there is evidence in that. They have taken cholesterol, dietary cholesterol, out of the guidelines in 2015. Mm -hmm. Where these issues come is if you're having higher amounts of saturated fat. Mm. A certain percentage of the population may see an increase in an abnormal lipid profile if they're having... Number one, too high saturated fat for them. Right. And also overconsumption of calories. It's not that a lean red meat is going to be bad for them. And right. I, I think that we've really... Lean red grass-fed meat. Yeah, I think that we've really vilified some of these things and it's out of, it's really out of turn. Yeah, we really have. I mean, you know, we, we actually saw in the mortality space that driving cholesterol too low would show up in hormone balance. Totally. You can see cellular metabolism starting to be mm -hmm. affected, I assume, because of cell membranes are you know, made from cholesterol, hormones made from cholesterol, vitamin D3 is made from cholesterol. I mean, there's so many, it's a construction material, right? I mean, it's a building block, it's not a fuel source. And, and I think we've just labeled it LDL high, bad, get it down. And I don't, I don't believe it's that simple and it doesn't no, sound like you do. I, I do not believe that it is that simple. And then of course, looking at a clearly scan, which is mm -hmm. a hard and soft black scan, I think all of these things are really beneficial. I will also mention why the confusion. Well, we've got like 40 million people on statins. Yes. And that uh, provides a lot of money to somebody. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that money puts a lot of money towards the way in which physicians make recommendations. Of course. Not and that the physicians are getting money, but the um, societies and associations. I, I, I think that rather than the first thing someone does, rather than go on a statin, is how are we addressing skeletal muscle health? Which, by the way, we don't measure directly. Most of us have a very difficult time meeting our protein needs, and certain protein sources like whey protein and others can be as little as 20% absorbable. This is 99% absorbable, and it has all of the essential amino acids that the body needs to build lean muscle, to recover, to improve our exercise performance, and most importantly, to repair after we have intense exercise. So this is called Perfect Amino by Body Health. It's, like I said, 99% absorbable. It only has two calories. Eventually, the caloric intake has virtually no caloric intake. It will not break a fast. It tastes amazing. You mix it in water. I take this literally every single morning. If you're working out in a fasted state, you have to take a full spectrum amino acid prior to your workout to preserve your lean muscle and make sure that you're recovering properly. And again, it will not break your fast. So the caloric impact is virtually zero. You get all of the full spectrum amino acids. It tastes wonderful. I use it every single day. You can go to bodyhealth.com forward slash ultimate. That's bodyhealth.com forward slash ultimate and look for the perfect aminos. They actually come in capsules if you're on the go or it becomes in several flavors that they make in a powder, which I love. It's flavored with natural um, uh, means of flavoring. So there's no artificial sweeteners in here. So this is one of my absolute favorite products. Give it a try. If you're working out at all, you need a full spectrum amino acid. Go to bodyhealth.com forward slash ultimate. That's bodyhealth.com forward slash ultimate. I love their lab tested products. You can actually see the absorption rate for all of their products. They've got great electrolyte protein combinations. My favorite is the perfect aminos. Bodyhealth.com forward slash ultimate. And now back to the ultimate human podcast. Mm. What about, what about, we talked about skeletal muscles effect on sugars and longevity and stability. What about its effect on cholesterol? Is yeah. there any evidence that improving your lean muscle mass would improve your cholesterol? Well, numbers? fatty acid, and we'll talk about is in terms of fatty acid oxidation, skeletal muscle is the primary site for fatty acid oxidation at rest. Wow. So a way to lower your triglycerides, other things considered, yes, you know, stable in your diet, adding lean muscle would have a positive effect on and exercise. So, you know, you want to utilize both blood fatty acids as well as intramuscular triglycerides. And, um, you know, another thing that you talk about in your book is the mindset, developing a mindset. Yeah. Um, not just as simple as muscle, more muscle live longer. It's a, it's a mindset. So talk a little bit about the mindset that, you know, a healthy adoption of a mindset. What do you, what do you mean by that? What are, you know, as humans, 
we all want growth. I, at least I believe that to be true. Mm -hmm. And if we do not seek out the challenge, it will find us. Mm -hmm. And it will find us in ways that are unbecoming and really will put us through a crucible. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've had the privilege of taking care of some of the most incredible entrepreneurs. A portion of my practice services all elite warfighters. My husband wow. is a former Navy SEAL. Okay. We see through SEAL Future Foundation and Task Force Dagger and Hunter 7 we take care of warfighters. That's awesome. Love yeah, that. we love them. That's I mean, awesome. well, you're married to a warfighter, married to so them. you yeah. got it. Yeah. Um, and well, number one, I felt like they weren't getting the care that they needed, and mm -hmm. you're seeing all this cancer, all this stuff. It's mm -hmm. terrible. Um, and I and when you talk about mindset, when you see things repetitively, and here I'm going to give you a great example: is that you were a mortality researcher. Mm -hmm you saw data set after data set after data set. What makes someone a good physician is being able to recognize patterns of disease. We expect right. that to happen. What makes someone an effective physician is being able to recognize patterns of people. Mm. And after seeing all of these elite warfighters, these entrepreneurs, patterns emerge. And these patterns are not different, whether they're going to war or going to proverbial war. Mm. They are neutral. They have a, a sense of neutrality. Mm. They didn't get too high or too low. It's not the last meal. They don't beat themselves up over the, the workout that they missed or et cetera. They're very neutral. I see. And that, I mean. Not being too hard on themselves. But not having a narrative about it. Okay. Or a health challenge. I'll give you an example. I, and what really drove this home for me is I used to have a large practice in New York City. Okay. And um, one of the war fighters came to see me. He was a former breacher. Do you know what a breacher is? No. Breacher oh, is Breaching like, the door? Yep. Okay. Breacher. They're the muscle of the team. Blow up a door? <laughs> yep. Blow up the door. He'd been in the teams for 20 years. He'd been to some of the most dangerous places on earth. He was home from a deployment on his motorcycle going five miles an hour, just like cruising. Putting along. A 17-year-old girl texting and driving completely took him out. Wow. He lost his leg. Okay. He's sitting in my office. And you know, I'm thinking, I'm five foot one. I'm married to a team guy. I take care of all these team guys. I'm going to get to the underbelly, right? Like, right. I'm just going to... Right. Get to him because I want to know how he's really doing and he can open up to me. And I have this whole narrative in my head. Right. <laughs> right. As uh, some women do, yeah. we just have like this whole thing. And he's sitting there. And I'm like, Brian, you know, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. And he looked at me like I asked him about the elephant in the tutu across the park. Right. And he's like, well, doc, you know, I, I told you I'm having some phantom limb pain. I'm pretty tired. What do you mean? I'm like, no, no, no. And I lean closer in. Mm -hmm. I'm like, Brian, how are you doing? He looked at me and he was like, oh, you mean my leg? That was like six months ago, doc. Oh. What are you talking about? Wow. And I was like, holy cow. He doesn't have a narrative. You know, in my mind, I'm thinking he's no longer the big alpha dude. He spent his life protecting our country. All of these things. Mm -hmm. He'd moved on. That's amazing. And I see this pattern of similarity between those that perform at the top, take their health and wellness seriously versus those that don't. Right. They have a neutral mind. The other thing that I see, and again, I know we're talking about how to develop a mindset. It is, there is capacity to do that. Right. It takes practice. Yeah. I talk about visualization a lot and, you know, a lot of people that, can't quit and stop smoking see themselves as a smoker people that can't lose weight see themselves as a fat person they develop a fat person personality um and you know a lot of it has to do with the way that we see ourselves and i think one of the ways to change the way that we see ourselves is to develop small promises to yourself a discipline that you keep to yourself that even the rest of the world doesn't know about i say it i'm going to go to bed at 10 o'clock i went to bed at 10 o'clock that's a win right um, you know, I, I said I was going to get a workout in this morning. It wasn't the best workout, but I got a workout in this morning. But you did it. You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah. and I, I, I agree with you. Um, 
So, um, you know, sort of in summary to kind of sum up this, this whole discussion, there are some metrics you think that you can measure, right? Push-ups, hang, uh, dead hang, um, squats, sit squats, squats. Okay. And these are body weight. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can maybe develop that baseline and, and, you know, see your progress improvement. There are markers in the blood that you can measure, Yep. right? Hemoglobin A1C, uh, insulin, Glucose, glucose, we talked about those markers. Yep. And we can develop a um, a diet that sets you up for success, which is roughly a gram Point, yep. per pound of body weight. Yes, so for ideal weight. Okay. So you, if you want to go in the lower end, it could be 0.7 grams to one gram per pound ideal body weight. So if okay. you are 200 pounds, but you want to be 150 pounds, then you eat for that. Men and women. Yeah. Okay. And then, and, and I don't know why it is that, that, for some reason, we think that men need more protein, maybe more volume of protein for the volume it's of muscle. It's just the size. It's but the it's, it's the size based. But it's weight based, so male and female. Um, as of now, the research as of now, there may be some things emerging, but as of now, because it's about that level of amino acids in the blood. Right. It's really not just getting protein per se, but you want that full spectrum of, mm -hmm. of, of amino acids. We talked about some of the sources for those. So if people want to take a deeper dive, get more information, where do they find you? Um, obviously forever strong. Um, I really, I truly mean that I read this book. I read it when I was at my, uh, retreat in Colorado, it had a big impact on me. I found it astoundingly, um, simple, to read real life examples in here. I can tell that you worked very hard on the messaging in this book. It took two years to write and two babies. I had two babies. <laughs> I had two babies and two years and... Do I have to be have two babies to live forever, <laughs> Dr. Gabrielle? I mean, I called it Forever Strong, not Marginally Weak, right? Like that yeah. might be the next book, Marginally Weak. But um, so people can find me on my website, drgabriellelion.com. Mm -hmm. I also have a podcast. Oh, great. Called The Dr. Gabrielle Lyon Show. Okay. I am active on Instagram and YouTube. We have a great newsletter okay, where beautiful. I summarize studies and it's all free information. Can people get that at your they website? Can. Okay, beautiful. Guys, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, one of my favorite guests, um, very practical way for living a longer, healthier, happier life, not heading down the road of chronic disease. I hope you enjoyed this podcast that you will find in the show links below, links to everything that Dr. Dr. Uh, Lyon spoke about, all the ways to find her online. And as I end every podcast, I ask every guest the same question. Um, and there's no right or wrong answer to this, but what does it mean to you to be an ultimate human? The, what does it mean, what, to, you what to, does be it mean to be the ultimate human? Uh, ultimately, <laughs> no pun intended, <laughs> to actualize my potential. Wow. I, simple, poignant. I like yeah. that, to actualize my potential. That's fantastic. Well, you heard it here first, guys. And as always, that's just science. 